Um, really briefing my background, I'm a, a technologist. I was an MIT guy. In fact, Bob reminded me of uh, when I was, <clears throat> gosh, when I was at MIT, I was doing a project at the Media Lab in probably, uh, probably 98, something like that. Uh, and one of those earliest revisions of, of Sensible, the haptic machine, I used in a project creating virtual musical instruments. So we had this SGI workstations, and you could sort of bang and tap on, on things and create music and drag it around these virtual surfaces. Um, it absolutely had the wow factor. I can attest to that. Um, so I've had a bunch of startup uh, companies that I've worked with, large and small, successes and failures. Uh, and I'm here not to talk about one particular one of those, but I want to talk about from the perspective of a technologist, uh, a few themes that help to kind of deepen our understanding of, of, this, of this building slippery products. Um, so we'll do some, kind of some anecdotes, uh, some examples, uh, and then if we have time, we'll take a couple questions. So first of all, this slippery stuff is not abstract concepts, right? Somewhere this gets baked into something that you're actually doing, and more often than not, it's getting baked into something that is happening as you build a product with your engineering team, with your product managers. Uh, so these principles are, are emerging from strong product development strategy, all this slippery stuff you're gonna get. Um, it's more important than ever to be familiar with the best practices of development. You'll find that as the, as the ideas of product management, as the ideas of web and mobile development uh, and all the software as a service tools have come out, there are best practices that are baking in a lot of this slippery stuff. So if you take advantage of them, if you're playing well in the ecosystem uh, from a product development perspective, you're going to get multiple wins kind of for free. And we'll give some examples of that. Thirdly, getting nat native. I think getting native is the key to this non-disruptive adoption that Michael talked about. So non-disruptive adoption means making your company a natural extension of what users already do, where users already are, and there are ways that you can build product to do that. And finally, I'll point to a couple things. I'm biased because I'm a technology guy, but I love looking at tech companies, how the tech companies, people who are selling developer tools to developers, um, have solved some of these problems. Don't think that just because they're kind of niche, because they're selling to a different audience than you, that maybe you should overlook them. There's a lot of companies growing really rapidly right now. You know, Michael has worked with some great companies that are growing rapidly in the open source uh, and in the developer tool space. So I'm gonna run through each of these eight again, if you'll bear with us, and we'll provide a little bit of color on them. First one, simple. Simple, I wanna be clear, doesn't mean easy, right? We talk about simple as if it's the idea that you kind of strip away all the complexity. Was it Mark Twain who said, I, I didn't have time to write a, write a short letter, so I wrote you a long one? Right? That's, I mean, that, that's the, the ultimate uh, thing on simple here. And the other thing is simple doesn't mean simple to you, it means simple to your customers. More often than not, simple to your customers means that you've solved a lot of really hard problems underneath the covers. So uh, Apple is given as an example for a lot of this uh, we've used. Apple, the iPhone on the surface is a really simple product, right? I mean, one screen, one button, what could be simpler than that? Everybody knows how to use it. But Apple had to do all sorts of amazing feats of engineering and years and years of R&D to actually make it that simple for users. One of my favorite examples is they had to build a proximity sensor uh, into the phone so that when you held it up to your face, your cheek wasn't pushing buttons. Right? No one had thought about this. This is something they got and they said, wow, this is not gonna be simple for users if they have to kind of hold it away from their face. Another example of this is Penultimate, the best uh, iPad note-taking app, so natural handwriting on it. Uh, ben Zotto was the founder of, of Penultimate. He actually helped build the Microsoft Xbox operating system, left Microsoft, decided to, to try his hand at, at iPad development built Penultimate, which on the surface is very simple, incredibly easy to use. He spent more time than anything dealing with algorithms for stroke analysis, stroke algorithms, and uh, wrist detection algorithms so that you weren't scrubbing across your, your pages and leaving marks as you were writing naturally. That's great examples of technology in the interest of a simple product for your customers. Innovation comes out of that simplicity. That's really the point here, right? Unless, Unless you have the focus that allows the simplicity, um, you're not gonna be able to innovate and that simplicity comes from your core. It's about figuring out those key things. So SaaS, we, we, we can talk all, all day about SaaS stuff, but this software as a service idea, there's people call it the Cambrian explosion of SaaS services happening right now. So this explosion of SaaS services says, you need to be building your, what I call your pillars. What we're talking about is the core. I imagine that core as the pillars that are holding your house up, right? If you don't have those pillars, then give up and go home right now. If you don't get these three things right, everything else 
you can hang around those things. And everything else you don't need to build yourself. So uh, you, might, you might build things like, like you've got to have, you've got to have the, the, the haptic stuff, right? You've got to have that technology for it. Or Apple has to build the internals of their phone. They have to make sure that the touch screen works. They've been buying people to, to produce that stuff. In your company, you've got a few things. It's probably not more than two or three that you absolutely have to get right and build yourself. Everything else, go say search, email, invoicing, subscription billing, uh, e-commerce integration, photo galleries, video encoding, charting, analytics. Probably none of you need to build a core competence around that. And if you do, you're wasting engineering resources. And you're not focused on that core uh, that you actually need to sell to the, sell to the clients. So low initial cost, the key to low initial cost is you've got to be able to upsell. And I think as Michael said, there's this often this problem that says, well, low initial cost means I'll figure out how to monetize later. If you build too much product, too much technology, too much engineering before understanding what your actual uh, monetization strategy is, then you might discover that you've painted yourself into a corner. You might discover I can't build a product from here that's monetizable. One of the things that I like doing most is to say, let's build a certain amount of our, of our platform and then start hanging other stuff off of that. We might not know right now which ones we're going to sell, which are going to be upsell opportunities, whether we're going to sell these things as plugins, what we're going to do, but let's make something that's modular so that now we can actually price and sell in the same way as we're building and putting these pieces together. Heroku is one of my favorite examples of this. If you, uh, do people know Heroku? Uh, it was actually acquired by Salesforce. What do you know? Um, but Heroku is a great example of a modular system for infrastructure and deployment. So it's a, a cloud-hosted environment where you can run, developers can run applications. So a developer basically pushes their code out and Heroku figures out how to put all the components together and get the thing running up, on a, up in the cloud. Heroku uh, has a great low initial cost, which is free. And when you go into your Heroku dashboard, you see literally a slider. I'm not kidding. You see this slider, and you can slide, and it increases the number of servers you have, and the dollar thing spins up and tells you how much it costs you per month. I mean, it couldn't be any easier to use, and it couldn't be any clearer what the, what the low initial cost is while still saying, we have something to upsell you. Heroku does something really smart then. They also recognize that you as a developer may not be building anything except your core functionality and you may want search and databases and analytics and, and cloud reporting and email services. And they have a marketplace. Uh, Salesforce has this too, the Salesforce App Exchange and Heroku has their add-ons where other companies have plugged in to Heroku. And you basically click a button on your dashboard and now you've got log file analysis. You just click a button and they say, we're going to sell you that for free, but we're also going to charge you by how much usage you do. So Heroku has this double whammy. They say, not only are we going to charge you by usage, but then we're going to also charge you on this entirely other axis of all the plugins that you put together. All of that requires a thought about your engineering up front. You, literally, you can never build this if you hadn't thought to yourself, I want to build a modular system up front. So I encourage you to sit down. You don't need to know the answers to this, but sit down with your engineers and say, are we building this in a modular way? How are these pieces separable? Could we charge for that and not charge for this? Could we upsell for that? That's a discussion to have at the time you're building it and not later on when you're struggling to find product market fit. My other favorite tip on this is, my startup secret to, to borrow Michael's great term, is you've got to instrument your application, which means Get the analytics in there. There's no excuse with the modern services out there to not know exactly what the behavior is of your web or mobile product. I mean, there's just no excuse anymore. You can't be flying blind. And furthermore, it's this great opportunity to say, let's get, let's figure out what our users are doing and where we can start to upsell them. So figure out where the breaks are. You can put artificial limits in place. You can do A-B tests to see which paths people take down your app. And then you can start to figure out what they're willing to pay for. Um, the other thing is don't underestimate willingness to pay. Bob had a great example where he said, oh yeah, we decided we were going to start charging our, our customers 50% up front. Uh, and lo and behold, they started doing it. Your customers will pay for value. <laughs> and you've got to make sure you have the value there, but don't underestimate the willingness to pay. Uh, if you get serious, by the way, about, about starting to price your, uh, 
um, you're offering. There's a, a Boston area startup called Price Intelligently. Uh, Patrick Campbell literally has a company that's designed to help companies figure out how to price their offerings in the marketplace uh, right here in Boston. Installs easily. This was the easiest one for me to come up with. The very best example of this right now, another developer tool, if you'll indulge me, uh, Crashlytics is a tool that says people have this problem when they started moving from the web onto mobile. On the web, everything that happens on your website happens on your servers and you've got analysis of it and you've got logs of it. It became the wild, wild west when people started pushing software back out to the, the end users. I mean, it was like the days of box software, but, but like frantic. And so people started pushing to hundreds of millions of mobile devices and had absolutely no idea how things were behaving when they were crashing, what was going on. It was made worse by fragmentation on Apple a little bit and on Android a lot. So Crashlytics created mobile error reporting. This is another Boston company founded by Wayne Chang. Um, and Crashlytics spent three months, Wayne has a great talk about this, three months building their product, right? Which actually had some pretty interesting technology in it. Uh, and then they spent nine months building the installer. So you imagine, okay, what's the installation process? So normally the way this works is that the installation process is you download some, some bun bunches of code and then you follow like an eight page guideline that says drag this here, put this here, change these placeholder variables to be your variables, all this kind of stuff. Which is fine, you know what, developers will follow that all day long. But what Wayne said is, we can do a lot better. So they built this incredibly sexy experience, the only word for it. You, you download a single app, you double click it, and it, it gets native. It goes into where the developers are living, which is on their Mac. So it was originally iOS. All, all uh, iOS developers are, are developing on a Mac. It puts something up in your, up in your uh, corner bar that, that brings down this beautiful sheet that starts to tell you, try this and click here, and I see you've done this. And we've got, gone ahead and installed the stuff automatically into your project. It's animated. It's really gorgeous. It's completely overkill. But you look at it and you say, this is stupidly overkill. And then you find out that it gets such rave reviews, and it was such a differentiator because of the ease of install, that among the small, tight-knit developer community went completely viral. And before you knew it, you, you were hard-pressed to find an iOS app that had not integrated Crashlytics. Um, that viral growth, along with a clear, um, the clear value in the analytics that was creating, uh, got them acquired by Twitter uh, not that long ago. Uh, another great Boston story. So it proves value quickly. Here's a company, uh, another Boston company uh, here in Cambridge. This is a discount ebook marketing platform. So basically, uh, BookBub, publishers pay to promote their books. So in short, publishers have this really hard time uh, getting in front of their audiences. Publishers have been disintermediated from their audiences by the retailers. So like Amazon's and the Barnes and Noble get in the way of this. They have no direct relationship. And basically, it's like the mobile app problem. It's, it's like, in order to get your mobile app noticed, you've got to get featured by Apple, which is kind of a Herculean task. Publishers have the same problem getting their books noticed by customers. So they pay for this, and then subscribers get a daily email. So look, subscriber side is easy. Subscribers get an email. The books match their interests, so maybe you're into sci-fi or horror or historic romance. Uh, you get books that are of interest to you that are curated by a team, and they've got really low prices. So the, the, you basically enter your email, super easy install, zero install, really easy to use. Uh, and you get this daily deals email with great deals on great books. The harder problem is, how do the publishers who are paying for this promotion know that it works for them? So Michael gave a great example of build a tool that says, here's the ROI. Like, just show it to them. Don't, don't let it be a mystery. Don't hope they figure it out for themselves, but justify it to them. So what BookBub did is they said, again, we're going to kind of get native. Publishers already have tools for this. They have native tools they use, and that's their dashboard on Amazon, their dashboard on Barnes & Noble, uh, their dashboard on Kobo and Sony and, and Apple iBooks, which is showing them their sales. So what BookBub said is, look, when you get this promotion, we're going to make it incredibly easy for you to see on the dashboards you already follow that you sold four books on Monday, four books on Tuesday, you were featured by us on Wednesday, and you sold 400 books on Thursday. And this value is so incredibly obvious when, uh, when people go in there. And then what they see is this amazing long tail, this kind of halo effect. Like, wow, people discover my book, and over the next few months, they're buying the sequel, and they're buying other things from this author. Uh, and the value is already proven right where it is. So BookBub could, could aggregate all this information, but in order to get it lean and get it out there, they made it really easy for people to find it where they already lived. So playing well with others, this is... This is uh, near and dear to my heart from a technology perspective, so I'm going to geek out a little bit on it. Um, 
But I really believe that building with open standards of technology is going to help you play nicely with others. Um, this is this is what enables all of those plugins to work with Heroku. This is what enables all of those app exchange things to work with Salesforce. Um, if if there's anything that you want to build, that core, that sliver. Remember, we drew, we have that we had that picture of of the of the MVS, right? Of kind of this this area in here that you're building. You've absolutely got to build this stuff, and you've got to design it and build it well. Maybe you find, if you're lucky, and you're growing your platform, that these other sections that maybe weren't your core, maybe you weren't really going after, if you build like Salesforce did or like Heroku did, then you're going to have people flocking to you because you're easy to work with, because you play with, uh, well with others. You're going to have vendors who also serve your customers who are going to want your customers, who are going to come there and they're going to plug into what you do. They're either going to pull your data or they're going to build plugins to integrate into your system. And all of that stuff is not just a, a, a business strategy. That stuff is code. That stuff is that your engineers made the decisions to build it in such a way that you could actually plug that stuff in. And these days what that means is having APIs. They don't have to be public APIs. They can be private stuff. If someone wants to pull your data, if you find an amazing strategic partnership, your biz dev guy goes out and says, hey, someone's willing to pay us for our data. We've discovered a whole other revenue stream. Your developers need to say, sure, we've got, a, we've got a REST API. They can plug into it really easily. They don't want some complicated thing. Those partners will go running for the hills if you say, well, we're going to take this stuff and we're going to print it out and then we're going to courier it over to you or we're going to drop it on your FTP server and here's the custom file format that we use. They want to know that you've thought about the technology and that you play with modern standards. So easy to use. I've mentioned this a number of times, but easy to use is Go to where your customer lives. Your easy to use means that your users are never disoriented by your product. I mean, that disorientation is the thing that drives you nuts. That's the thing that's the problem when you open that iPhone app and you immediately say, oh my god, I'm closing this. It's, it's because you're disoriented, because it's not familiar to you. Um, Twitter, we never think of as an SMS platform anymore. That's where they started, right? 2005-ish, 6-ish, I think they launched. Uh, got big at South by Southwest. At that time, they were just SMS. So that was a terrible platform for doing messaging, but it was where all the customers were. And by integrating with that, they said, let's make this thing as easy to use as possible, and then it took off. Cloud app is great. I take a, I take a screenshot on my Mac, and it automatically sends the screenshot up to the cloud and copies onto my clipboard uh, a, a URL that I can use for sharing it. It's totally magic. It's totally silly. But it goes exactly to the heart of a native workflow for me. They don't ask me to learn a new workflow. They say, take a screenshot just like you always do, but we're going to make it magically shareable for you. One thing I'll point out on mobile that I see a mistake made far too frequently um, by me and by others is Android and iOS really are different. Um, and I always encourage people to start with one platform and go with one platform as long as you can possibly stand it. Because when you start with two platforms, inevitably, it becomes too costly for you to design two completely different products. And so you design this horrible hybrid thing where your Android app feels too much like an iOS experience or vice versa, or even worse, neither of them feel native to their audiences, and you won't get uptake that way. And so especially on mobile, be aware that they're very different audiences with very different expectations. Um, and it's one of the big challenges of mobile development. I mean, as building mobile, um, it really is hard. There's huge payoff, but it's a lot harder to build than a, a single web experience where you have a lot more flexibility. So getting down to the final couple here. Um, ROI, uh, you can save people time, you can save people money. Personally, I love saving time because as a technology guy, I've always had, a, uh, I've always had this desire to replace people with, with shell scripts. That's what I say, people with computer programs of any variety. Um, so figure out where people are actually spending their time. I'm going to tap another example that Bob gave. He said, uh, he said he sat down with the customers and they told him everything was great. Here's what we do, right? And across a table, you can say to someone, what do you do? And they'll tell you. If you say, let me follow you around and see what you do, it's going to be really, really different. Right? You're never going to have a sales guy. You say, what do you do? Sales guy's going to say, well, I, I take phone calls and, um, uh, and I'm constantly reaching out and I'm thinking about the strategy and I'm honing my deck. And then you sit down and what does the sales guy really do? He cuts and pastes data from emails that are inbound and he pastes them into his CRM system. 
and then he cuts and pastes things out of the CRM system into DEX to customize, and then he cuts and pastes something else. This cut and paste disease is insidious, and it's my favorite symptom of this idea that people are wasting time where computers could help them. Yes, where is a, a Boston area company that says, hey, let's actually put the CRM into your email system to help you with that, and Streak is another one, and there are oodles of these, and again, Salesforce is trying to do the same thing. Salespeople are a great example of this, but it happens all over. Um, one tip is look for this inside your own organization. For those of you who are growing to a place where you're not entirely sure what everyone's doing all day, you might find that you've hired really smart, really resourceful, and really detail-oriented people. And those are exactly the kind of people that create cut and paste workflows for themselves because they're desperate to get the job done and damn it, they're gonna get it done you know, without having to pull anyone else's resources. And you might find that there's really great places to use technology in your own business to help that. Uh, I think for your customers, if they see if they see things that are streamlined, if they see their own employees, if they see their own workflows speeding up, uh, then that's going to be an obvious ROI for them. The final one I'm going to cop out on a little bit. Uh, I, I would contend that if you've built Slipper, then you're probably build Slippery. Um, the point here is that all of those other things are going to contribute to stickiness. So Dropbox is trying to create a really sticky experience, obviously. They're trying to take over the world right now. Um, they want to create the best experience, one that's simple, one that's easy to install. Simple's not easy for them, right? It's a lot of technology goes into making Dropbox as simple as it is, a lot of magic there. They want to make it easy to install, they want to make it easy to use, which it is, arguably the easiest of all those cloud services. They want an indispensable network, which touches on low initial cost, meaning there's not a lot of barrier to join. It's the only way you're going to build an absolutely gigantic network these days. Uh, the only way to get to hundreds of millions of users uh, is if you've got some sort of a freemium offering or a free offering. And then it has to play well with others. Look at the ecosystem of things that are plugging into Dropbox. I mean, it's hard to download a mobile app these days that doesn't have a connection into Dropbox. They've done an incredible job of building the engineering and the API. The amount of, of infrastructure and plumbing going on behind the scenes to make that work is, is amazing. And finally, they've got addictive value, so it's sticky for their users. That addictive value comes from proving it really quickly. You know, we've saved money, we've improved our collaboration, we've saved people time because now they all have access to the documents on the business stuff. Um, and the ROI is obvious for those businesses, so especially for businesses um, where, where they were having other local file storage solutions or SAN arrays or backups or extra IT people, all that stuff is gone. So Dropbox is chasing all three of these. I think it's a great example of how all those other components come together to make something that's super sticky. That's what I got. Thank you guys very much.